I don't know about you, but I've already, already feel that the uh, the Spirit has been here this morning. He is ministering this morning and speaking to us. Uh, I pray that uh, He will continue to speak, whether it's through me in the next few minutes or or where, however it is that you will you will be listening to Him as as we proceed through this whole. Uh, the rest of this service. Uh, if you've been here over the last few weeks, you know that we've been talking about this idea of freedom, this idea of not what it means to be free in Christ. And I know we've been talking about the, uh, the initial idea of freedom, of being liberated from the penalty of sin, very similar to what he, we were just singing about, this idea of God's grace coming in and, and cleansing our hearts and, and putting us on a new path. And, and last week we discussed the, the idea of um, having our faith be defined by various things, by, by faith in Christ, but also by uh, developing community and reaching out to other people, um, and, and how th- those are the things that should define uh, what our faith looks like as, as we go into our life, as we go through our life. Um, and as I was thinking about this week, I was, uh, we're going to be going a di- little bit different route, and I don't know if any of you guys are like this, but I have, um, there are a few different, t- I don't watch a, a lot of regular television because I don't have, I don't have a satellite or anything. Basically, everything I watch is on Netflix and Hulu. And one of the things I've kind of rediscovered lately um, are those like restoration shows. Like uh, one of my favorites is called Fast and Loud, where they basically find old cars and they they rebuild them and then they're awesome. And then I have to repent for the coveting that I'm doing as as I'm watching the service or watching the the show. And I, and I know those are very popular, those kinds of restoration things are very popular. Uh, some of you probably prefer to watch the ones where they buy a really dumpy house and remodel it, and, and there are a bunch of those on HGTV, and, and I like to watch it when they're doing motorcycles. Uh, uh, there's another one that I, I hesitate to, uh, to tell you I like, but there's a show that was called Bad Ink that was on a few years ago, and basically it's these guys go around looking for people with really bad tattoos and make them not bad anymore, and it's just kind of an amazing thing to watch. And, and the thing that I always, in all of those situations, what I, I see is whatever it is, and some, sometimes it's, you know, people need a treehouse, which that was a kind of phenomenal show. I wish, I was going to take pictures because we've got somebody in the church who should probably be working for the guy who builds those treehouses. Uh, Joe Shank built, one, built a playhouse for his girls. That's just phenomenal. If you want to see it, drive down Old 35 when you go into town the day, and you can see it. it. It looks like he was completely wrong in everything he did, but it was all on purpose. Um, but the thing that always blows my mind with that is they'll pull, they'll pull a car um, that's just in the middle of, you know, they'll have weeds growing up through it, and they'll pull it out, and, and they'll say, we're going to make something valuable of this. Or they'll, they'll see a, a tattoo that's just beat up, and they'll make it something pretty. And, and you can't even see the, the mess that was underneath. Or or you see those houses that look like they're falling down, and then, and then within you know, 20 minutes, they've restored the whole thing, and it's beautiful, and people are spending a lot more money on it. Or, uh, but the, the, the idea of these people looking at these things and seeing something other than what they are, and how they have a, a plan for what's going to happen, and, they come, and these, the people who are really good at it, it's amazing, because they can tell you, here are the things we're going to do, and, and I just love watching those kinds of shows, partly because I can't do any of that stuff. Um, but I'm always amazed at what they do and the plan they have and the restoration that comes out of that and the value that is created based on, on this, the, the plan and, and the vision that these people have. Um, and unfortunately, I think a lot of times what we do in our own lives is, and, and the tele- television shows don't really help much with this, we believe that honestly translates to human beings. We believe that, that it honestly, we can, we can um, if we look at ourselves and we're not happy with it, with some surgery and, and diet and exercise, and you know, they had makeover shows and all those types of things, we believe that we sh- human beings, people, should be the exact same way. That you can find something that's in a really bad shape, and then miraculously because... Uh, through the power of humanity or whatever, we can make something 
different than it is. And I realize you can lose weight if you need to lose weight, if you work hard enough and all those types of things. But unfortunately, many of us, we are equivalent to those beat up cars in the middle of a field with roots growing up through it. Or we're, we're equivalent to a, a really, really bad tattoo. And, and we don't understand because, because of all these other things and what we're being told by the world around us, we feel hopeless. We feel ugly. We have shame because we can't do that. We compare ourselves. You know, some of us, you know, if we're going to use a car illustration, some of us are, are more, um, I, don't, I don't know, yeah, more Yugos than, than, than uh, Lamborghinis, right? And, and, or we're more uh, pickup truck than sports car. And, and, and as a result, when we look at the world, the world says people should be sports cars. And as a result, we compare ourselves to things that we can't be. We struggle with the fact that we are, are, are not that, and we become embarrassed, and we become ashamed, and we struggle with so much stuff because life is not like television makeover shows. And it's hard for us. And as a result of all of that shame and that comparison and that guilt that comes in, we, we end up being enslaved by the ideas of those around us, by the opinions of the people around us, by our own mindset, what we think we should be, the failures that, that we look at, all this beautiful stuff, and we say, I can't be that because I fail in so many ways. And we, we get in bondage to the ideas and the thoughts of other people. And I have asked the question earlier, when we were, before we started the series, I asked the question of a lot of different people, of, give me your ideas. What do you, how do you respond to this idea of freedom in Christ? And I, I, I kind of struggled with where to read these, and I actually had some on audio, but didn't get them translated over into, into the, uh, the computer today. But when we start talking about this idea of freedom in Christ, it's a completely different idea. Because here's what I want you to hear this morning. No matter what the world says, no matter what the people around you say, your friends say, your family says, because honestly, let's face it, so many times the stuff that bogs us down the most is not necessarily what the world in general believes, but it's what family, has, the expectations they have on us, so the expectations we've put on ourselves. Here is what I want you to know. The bottom line this morning is that the freedom in Christ allows you to be the person you are supposed to be. Freedom in Christ allows you to be you. And I just want to read, uh, there are five responses from people in the church, when I ask, what does freedom in Christ mean to you? And I just want to lay this, I want to read these as a foundation. If you don't hear anything else this morning, or if maybe you're tired of hearing the words that, that I, you know, that I speak, I want you to hear the experience of five people from Fellowship of Faith when we say the idea of the words, uh, the words freedom in Christ. First one is from uh, Kelly Jo McCullough. And she said, even though I have to try always to do the right thing, I don't have to be burdened with the failure when I fall short. I know I have a God that will forgive me faster and more completely than I can forgive myself. I don't have to fear living in the world when I know he doesn't expect perfection. If perfection without Christ was a standard, with Christ, with, no one could make it through. You could only live under a rock with no outside influence and still fall short. And she says she hopes that makes sense, which it makes perfect sense. That's from Kelly Joe. Craig Sanders said, when I think about freedom in Christ, I think about becoming who God wants me to be. When I was younger, I always patterned myself after the cool group of kids. I had to, do the best of, I had to have the best of everything. I acted like them because I thought that, that what I was, that's what I was supposed to do. When I said yes to Jesus, I realized I didn't have to be perfect. I decided to be transparent. I got to be my, become myself, which is way better than the cool kids if I'd have to say so myself. Always humble. And uh, this one comes from Jen Mills, who's not here this morning. Uh, she actually recorded hers, but it says, In Christ, I have the freedom to be myself. I've been given the choice of trying to fit into the world or be the person God created me to be. I can choose to constantly feel like I fall short of others' expectations and miss the mark, or because of Christ, not have any shortcomings, 
And when you throw the forgiveness of sin and promise of eternal life in my choice, in, in my choice is to live in the freedom that Christ provides. And Jennifer Blevins, is she here? She went back, didn't she? Um, I have always struggled with, waiting to, with wanting to be liked and accepted by everyone. I hate being left out of things and feeling that I'm not wanted. But I've been learning a lot in the past month or so that I have the freedom to come to God and be accepted in love, never left out, no matter what. He will always want me around, no matter how silly and awkward I am. I have the freedom to be who I am and who I'm called to be and still loved with no strings attached. The final one came from Chris Whaley, and it said, Freedom in Christ to me means freedom to be myself and still loved by Christ, even in my many flaws and failures. I don't have to try to be something I'm not to be liked or accepted because he already knows me better than I know myself and loves me anyway. I'm free to be me, free to be real. That, those are five stories. And I've got a lot of other examples, a lot of other responses, and, and maybe next week um, in the fourth Sunday I'll let you hear some of those others. But the recurring theme through those five was this freedom that comes from understanding the grace of Jesus Christ, that you can be free to be the person God has created you to be. In my life, many times I have struggled because of my personality and the things I think and the way my brain works, feeling like it didn't, it didn't fit. It, doesn't, it didn't make sense to a lot of people. Many of you feel the same way, maybe because it's not, it's not the way you think or the way that you interact publicly, but because of your weight or because of, of your academics or whatever it is. And as a result, you put up barriers or you created a facade or do what, whatever it takes to, to, to kind of fit in or to keep from being hurt by all that comparison and all that failure. And I want to tell you this morning that, the, that if you accept Christ, Christ will accept you for who you are. He will love you. He will, he will forgive the sin. And we're going to talk a little bit more about the fact that as, as you give your life to Christ, he, it, just like these guys who do the restoration cars, he has a plan, and the plan is beautiful. But as you walk through life, as you go through the, the failures and, the, and the, all the different things in your life, God will still love you. He still, he still accepts you. He still wants you to have a relationship with him, regardless of what you think about yourself. And that's one of the most most liberating experience of your life to realize that it might be it might not be the case with the seven billion people on the planet but with with God the creator of the universe he loves you he accepts you he created you to be who you are and to be so much more that is amazing freedom I want to read um, our passage today is in, is in Ephesians 2 We're going to start with verse 1. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. You used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He's a spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature, By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, He gave us life when He raised Christ from the dead. It's only by God's grace you've been saved. For He raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with Him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us in all future ages as examples of the incredible wealth of His grace and kindness toward us as shown in all He has done for us who are united with Christ Jesus. Christ saved you by His grace when you believed. And you can't take credit for this. It's the gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things you've done, so none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece. He has created us new in Christ Jesus so we can do the things He planned for us long ago. You are God's 
masterpiece. I don't know about you, but there are a lot of days I don't feel like a masterpiece. There are a lot of days where I feel the whatever the opposite of a masterpiece is. Finger painting from thir- three-year-olds, I guess. I don't know. Although moms think those are also masterpieces. But there are days that we feel so much less than a masterpiece from the Creator God. But those of you who have placed your faith in Christ, I want you to understand, I want you to get this understanding this morning and remember, just grasp a hold of it. It doesn't say you will one day be a masterpiece. It does not say at the end of your life, when you go to heaven, you will be a masterpiece. It does not say when you get it all right, you will be a masterpiece. This scripture says you are. You are. Think of the most beautiful artwork that you have ever seen. If you're not an art person, think of the most beautiful 67 Chevelle you've ever seen. If you don't know what that is, I pity you, think of something else really pretty, okay? But think about it. The thing that you look at in your life and you say, that is the picture of perfection. That is you in the sight of God. That is freedom. That is excitement. That is the kind of thing that should make you skip through life, metaphorically speaking. You are a masterpiece. The scriptures that we were looking at in Ephesians 2, it talks about some of the other things we discussed over the last two weeks. It defines where our freedom comes from. Freedom coming from Christ, who died for us, who was raised from the dead, and when we place our faith in Him, we are, we are liberated from the penalties of sin and from all the other stuff that goes along with that. He defines our freedom. But he also talks about, like we talked about last week, of having a defined freedom. Having those areas that show where your freedom begins and ends. By, by you know, as, as Kelly said in her, um, her thing, by pursuing the right thing. Pursuing following God and doing the things that God has placed on us and, and the expectation of pursuing righteousness. It's in there. But then... He goes on to say, that's not what has saved you. That's not anything. It came from Christ. Don't, it's not anything that you have done. You are a masterpiece. Other places in Scripture, not only does it say we are a masterpiece, it says that we are God's children. We are God's children. When we make that, when we make that, this, that change translation, not only, I mean, the one thing that you could think of, if you're not a particularly crafty person, but if you were a parent or a grandparent or even an aunt and uncle or, or just you know, someone who's close and you've seen a child, you've become a child, the only thing that I would value more than, well, this is not true, but the only thing that you can think of that would be more valuable than a masterpiece or something like that is your kid. There are other things I know, but, but your child, if you can think of anything else, as a, as a dad, that's the one thing, if there's a fire in the house, I'm going to make sure my kids get out, and Amy, but she'll be actually probably be the one to make sure I get out first, honestly, because I won't notice that the house is on fire. <laughs> um. We're going to make sure because we look at the kids, we see ourselves in our children, we see the, the plans, the, the ideas, the, 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 the potential of our child. And, and it's exciting. And when we have to realize that when God looks at us, He doesn't just look at us as His masterpiece, He also looks at us as His children. He cares about us. He loves us. And again, in, in that uh, that's you know, a quote from, some, from various uh, passages, but he says, you are my children. You do not have to earn uh, childhood. You are there. I like the fact that it says that um, he planned it long ago. 
And other verses, uh, versions say a lot of different things. It talks about, you know, other verses say he prayed predestined it and he planned it. But the high, whole idea is that God knew before the foundation of the earth who you are going to be. He knew what you were going to look like. He knew the personality you were going to have. He knew the experiences that you would undergo, some wonderfully joyous and some very, very difficult. He saw all of those things. He saw who you were. And He planned what you could be. He saw your life. He had a plan for you. Because you were a masterpiece before you were even born. You are. As, a, as this talks about, but as you, as you, when you may place your faith in Christ, I, there are three things that you are that I want you to see. You are free from shame. The other, other scripture says, if you are in Christ, you're a new creation. Things have changed. You, the old is gone. The new has come. We are reconciled with God. We are born with all this other junk, all this stuff. And as we go through our lives, there are all these other things, and we get dents and dings, and the paint gets faded. And we, we, we start rusting out. There are so many other things that happen, and, and we, we just feel... We, we can start looking like one of those cars you see just stuck out in the middle of a field somewhere. And then you make contact with Christ. He creates something new. And we are reconciled to Him, to the One who built you in the first place. The One who, who knows the plan, sees the beauty that you could be. And we are reconciled to Him. And the shame goes away because your hand, you are in the hands of the One who created you in the first place, the one who loves you, the one who knows what is best. And the shame stops. It should stop. Unfortunately for you and for me and for many of us, uh, regardless of the fact that we can be, uh, as uh, Chris said in his thing, that we can just be ourselves in front of, you know, we can be uh, ourselves. Craig said he could be transparent. Even though we can be transparent in the, in the presence of our God, we get bogged down because we can't be transparent in the presence of human beings. And we continue to be bound by those things. And if you get nothing else this morning, I want to encourage you that in, in those times, as you go through your life, when you start feeling like the comparisons are overwhelming and when there's so much stuff coming on to you that you just feel like you are completely bound, remember that none of that shame is put on you by God. God loves you. He wants what's best for you. You are a masterpiece to Him. We are free from the need to measure up. The only, only uh, point of comparison we have is Christ, and none of us can, can hold up to that measuring stick. That's why we need grace to allow us to be reconciled to God. I'll be, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to give you some... It's, it's hard. I know it's hard because it's hard for me thinking that you're not measuring up. For me, a lot of times, it's measuring up in my own career my own calling, my own job, looking and, and seeing other things and start compare, and looking at comparison to other places, other churches, other, other pastors, seeing how it seems like things are together in one place, and then I come here, and, and, and I love this church, and the, but there, in every church, in every, there are issues that have to be taken, taken, taken care of. And when you go and have lunches with pastors, they don't particularly tell you about all the crap that's hit the fan. They don't tell you about that stuff. Every pastor I have, I, I, I have lunch with is in a growing, vibrant church. And things are great. 
And I'll tell you, that's, that's a struggle sometimes for me. Because you guys know me, I'm not going to paint that picture. You know, that's just not, that's not the way it works. Others of you in this place are in other jobs where you constantly feel like you're compared. And you have to measure up to expectations. And in some situations, some of you are even, even in situations where you're being held up to expectations that are completely unreasonable and unattainable. Some of them are your own expectations, your own put things you put on yourself, but others are just, whether it's jobs or family or, or friends or even sometimes as parents, your children put on, uh, they put unreasonable expectations on who you were supposed to be. And it's hard. But the one person with whom you never have to worry about measuring up is God. You never have to worry about those things with Him. The grace that He gives you, that He bestows freely upon you, eliminates the need to measure up. It eliminates it. Takes it away. I realize in, in, in Scripture, uh, I, was, I was reading uh, 1 Corinthians 12 this week, which talks about spiritual gifts. And a lot of times when we read that passage, we focus on, you know, everybody has a different spiritual gift, and we have... Uh, everybody should serve in the church, and usually when pastors are reading that, they're trying to get you to sign up to serve somewhere, and that's not what I'm talking about this morning, but the thing that I saw there in that was, was this. We all are special to God. We are masterpieces, but we're all not the same masterpiece. We all have roles that we can play in church, in ministry and things like that, but also we have Relation, we have uh, personalities, we have experiences, we have characteristics that are all special to the plan that God has. We say, well, I, I, I need to do ministry, so I, need, I should be, I should, it looks like this. I should follow Christ, and therefore it looks like this. And, when I, and, and, and I see other people who do this so well, and, and maybe if I do that better, and maybe if I measure up and I start doing things the way they do it, then I will measure up to that, that point of reference. And God, I will have more of Jesus somehow. God will be happier with me. There is nothing in Scripture that tells us that we are required to measure up to other people around us who are followers of Christ. It is not there. We are free to be who God wants us to be. We are free from that requirement to measure up, the need to measure up. You're also free to become. I didn't finish the sentence, but that's it. You're free to become. Scripture in Ephesians says, you used to be like this. Once you were dead because of your disobedience and your many sins. But Christ brought you to life. Once you were bound by all of this behavior and all of this stuff. But, Christ, but the Spirit li lives differently in you. Once you were, you were led by the flesh by your own desires. But the Spirit can come through you and change you and make you something else. I know it sounds kind of weird because we were just talking about the not the need, having the need to measure up. And then to say, well, then you're talking about I need to change. The idea behind this, it's, it's, just, it's nothing more than growing in a relationship with Christ. Growing in the relationship with your Creator who has a plan for you. The crazy thing, and I still don't understand this, and I struggle so much with it, is how do, you, how do you balance the idea of grace with this idea of a need to pursue righteousness? How in our mind, in our mind, our, our, our human minds, it's impossible to pursue something and then not feel like a failure when you do not attain it. Because in our lives, if you don't attain it, someone, somewhere... Maybe us, maybe other people are saying you're a failure. 
God has a plan. He wants you to go, he, he, love, he has a plan for you to go a certain way. And as you are going that way and falling, and, and, and maybe your progress isn't as great as you want it to be, but you're going that direction, he continues to say, you're a masterpiece. I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense. But when we follow God, Christ, we are free to become something new. And even if the process isn't what we expect, we are still free from the shame of that failure. That's the definition of grace. I don't get it. I wish I did because maybe I would be a little more gracious toward folks sometimes. But that is the promise that we've been given. A new creation. We are, become, we are God's masterpiece. He created you to be you. And He will take everything, all your flaws, all those different things, and make them, make them something beautiful. You can become. You are free to develop and to be something new. God already sees the finished product. I'm always amazed at those shows when those guys say, I know exactly what we're going to do. And then afterwards you look at it and think, how in the world did they see that from the scrap heap that they, that they bought? Houses are, are a big thing too. You see those on those eight Home and Garden channel when people take a house that just looks like a wreck and you look at it afterwards and you say, how, how do they even know that that would work? Because they're craftsmen. They are the artists. They see the masterpiece before it is finished. God sees the finished product, even if we don't. He sees what we can be. He loves us. I was thinking this week about this whole, whole process and about this idea of failure and how um, so often as, as Christians, um, our, ourselves and, and among other folks, when people, um, when, when we fall, when we fall and we fail or Maybe we've, we haven't been doing what we think we need to be doing. We get this mentality that as we're lying there on the ground, God is yelling at you to get up while He's standing on your neck. And He's yelling, why don't get up? Why are you falling again? I am so incredibly disappointed in you. You're supposed to be better than this. Why do you constantly make the same stupid decision? I, have ma- I gave you my grace and you are walking all over it. Why do you keep doing this? But what he's really saying is get up. Get up. You are special to me. I have my grace. My son did not die for you to give up now. You are a masterpiece. If you continue moving, I, trust me, things will be different. I want you to get up. Please, I, what do I need to do to help, you lift, help lift you up? Do I need to come along beside you? What does it take? I want you to succeed. I'm not waiting for you to fail. You are special to me. Get up. Get up. I see it. I see the end point. I see the finished product. You, are so, you can be so much more. You are beautiful the way you are, but there is something else to it. I love you. If we can grasp the freedom of that Christ, our whole perspective will change. Every interaction we have with other people will change. People who grasp that kind of freedom express that kind of grace to the people around them. We must embrace the fact that the shame is gone. That, that, those handcuffs are off. We must understand that the the manacles of measuring up have been released. We are no longer in the stocks of being stuck 
where we are. We are free to become something new. Freedom in Christ allows you to be free to be you. So how will you allow that freedom to define you? How will you live in that type of freedom? We talk about freedom a lot in the United States. We talk about it a great deal. When there are major controversies going on, we talk about it more on both sides of the, of the um, aisle. When we talk to our military people, we say they fight for our freedom. Those are all wonderful things. I am glad to live in the United States. But the freedom Christ offers us this morning transcends every political establishment. It transcends where you live. It transcends where you were born. It transcends color. It transcends socioeconomic status. It transcends all of those things. You have a promise to be free. If you're living in a place that, that if you're living in the, uh, a hole in the ground or in a mansion, the freedom He offers is for you. The freedom that we discussed this morning is created for you. You know, over the last 2,000 years, there have been many empires built. There have been many nations that have risen. They have fallen. The world has moved on. I'm sure that as that was happening, the people in those, in those empires and those nations didn't, they, they were hopeless. They felt like com they were completely hopeless because things had changed so much. But over the last same length of time, the promise of Christ, the promise of freedom in Christ has gone in and out of those nations and other nations. And it continues to be true. It continues to have the same strength. It continues to off be offered to anyone who will accept. You have the opportunity this morning to be known as a masterpiece. You are God's masterpiece. What will you do with God's masterpiece this morning?